Let me welcome everyone. My name is Sonu Beatty. I'm an assistant professor here uh, in the Department of Government. I teach courses in constitutional law and political theory. And I really have the honor of uh, basically doing nothing here in the panel other than being the moderator. I mean, I'm not, which basically means I'll point to people when they ask questions. I mean, this is the, the real heft will take place to my left. So let me just introduce uh, the panelists uh, that we have. We have uh, Professor John Graby, who's a professor of law at the University of New Hampshire, who will represent the judicial branch. We have the Honorable Paul Hodes, who's a former U.S. congressman, who unsurprisingly will represent uh, uh, the legislative branch. And then we have uh, uh, Donald Relly, who's a Solicitor General of the United States, that will represent the executive branch. And let me say what this sort of panel is about, or sort of what the, the theory behind it is. That the separation of powers really is uh, a crucial component of the United States Constitution. And I encourage all of you actually to read the United States Constitution if you haven't. It's a short uh, document. Uh, uh, it was actually written to be uh, uh, read by those uh, deciding whether to ratify it. Uh, and if you start reading it after the preamble, the very first three articles, Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3, are about each branch of government. Article 1, uh, about the executive branch. Article 2, uh, the Congress, the legislative branch, and Article Three, the judicial branch. And so uh, today what we're going to do is go in reverse order. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Professor Graby to go first and talk about the judicial branch, and then uh, the Honorable uh, Paul Hodes to talk about the legislative branch, and then finally uh, 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 General Verrilli, uh, uh, although uh, I'm told uh, that uh, it's actually not, the, ge the, the general word there is actually an adjective and not a noun. It's really the general solicitor. Uh, so, um, but as we said, General really sounds a lot better. Uh, uh, had some sort of military title the students got. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm gonna have them speak for about 10 minutes each uh, so they can sort of lay out what they think is important in thinking about separation of powers and then the idea is to open it to questions uh, for you all. So, they will leave it to. Professor Gravy. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really, really uh, pleased to have been asked to, to, to speak with you uh, here today. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I am not a judge. Uh, I've never played a judge on TV. Um, <laughs> judges tend not to like to talk uh, too much about uh, their underlying theories, or at least frequently don't like to. And so um, I, um, uh, I will serve as a proxy. I worked for six different uh, federal judges within the First Circuit, the Federal First Circuit, which encompasses New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, and Puerto Rico, uh, for about 17 years. And so um, uh, I tend to think about constitutional law from the perspective of the judiciary, having worked for uh, that branch for so long. And I, I teach constitutional law uh, at the University of New Hampshire uh, School of Law. And I'd, I'd like to use as my point of departure uh, a line uh, that uh, General Verrilli paraphrased yesterday from Marbury <coughs> versus Madison, uh, which is uh, a case that everybody has heard of. Uh, most of us attempt to study it uh, in high school in a civics class. Uh, I never understood it then, certainly. Um, I'm just now starting to feel like I have some uh, appreciation of what was going on in that case. Uh, but and, and in, in any event, the line in question is, um, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Um, now, this is one of the most cited sentences uh, in all of constitutional law. Uh, it is seen as summarizing the conclusion that the judiciary is to have the last word on constitutional meaning, uh, at least insofar as there is a disagreement uh, between the judiciary and one of the coordinate federal branches of the government uh, or uh, between the judiciary uh, and the states. Um, since this is about separation of powers, we'll, we'll just stay on that horizontal plane and talk about disagreements among uh, or between the judiciary and the other two branches. Um, as an aside, uh, Marbury, uh, Marbury famously established the power of judicial review, uh, the power of the judiciary to strike down as unconstitutional an act of Congress. Uh, but it also, and less famously, um, established uh, the power of the federal judiciary to strike down uh, the constitutionality of executive conduct. Not all executive conduct, but uh, executive conduct undertaken uh, when the president acts as the executing agent uh, for Congress. Um, and so uh, Marbury is important uh, for, for both of those reasons. Um, as another aside, uh, neither conclusion uh, that, that, that the federal statute under examination was unconstitutional or 
uh, that the president's agent had acted in an unconstitutional way. Neither of, of those conclusions was necessary uh, to the decision in Marbury. Um, but that's a story for another day, uh, hopefully for those of you who are in college uh, for your first day of con law in law school. Um, but anyway, back to uh, this question. What does this sentence mean? It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Um, the question of what this sentence means and what this sentence should mean is one of the prominent themes in an introductory constitutional law class. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of views on this, but I'll just describe the, the two ends of the spectrum, maybe the two polar opposites. Should this statement uh, be given a very, very strong reading? Does it mean, in other words, that the judiciary has a special competence and a special obligation, one not shared by uh, officials of the coordinate branches, uh, to determine constitutional meaning? Um, that, uh, or as an alternative to that, uh, one could construe this sentence to mean simply that in cases that come before the judiciary, uh, the judiciary is to apply the Constitution uh, as the supreme law of the land under Article VI of the Constitution. But uh, when it's analyzing uh, the constitutionality of an act of Congress uh, or a policy decision or act undertaken by the executive, uh, that it ought to exercise deference and, and restraint uh, in evaluating the work of the coordinate branches um, because the officials of those coordinate branches themselves also swear oaths to uphold the Constitution. Um, and the assumption is that they take the meaning of the Constitution uh, into account uh, as they engage in their work. Um, now, theorists favoring this weaker meaning, uh, the latter meaning, uh, argue that courts should therefore employ doctrines of judicial restraint to avoid, whenever possible, conflicts with the coordinate branches of the federal government uh, and should reserve their use of judicial review to circumstances where the challenged enactment or where the challenged conduct is, is clearly unconstitutional uh, or where the judiciary, for example, uh, sees a need to intervene and protect a minority group and thus ensure the proper functioning uh, of representative democracy. Um, uh, a prominent example uh, of the court uh, employing a, a weaker reading um, uh, comes from a case called U U.S. versus Nixon, uh, which involved the uh, uh, impeachment of a federal judge uh, from Mississippi. Um, he alleged that the way he was impeached and removed from office, and he alleged that the way in which uh, the Senate conducted his trial in removing him from office did not comply with the meaning of the Constitution, in, in particular in the, in the meaning, with the meaning of the word try. And the Supreme Court said, you know, that's, that's a political question. That's the meaning of the word try is something that's left for the Senate to decide for itself uh, what it means. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a restrained view there. Um, you know, it may be emphatically uh, the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law means, uh, but it doesn't have to say uh, what the law means every single time there is a dispute about what the law means. Um, I use U.S. versus Nixon as an example of uh, uh, a case involving the weaker reading because there's also a case called United States versus Nixon, which is a great example of the court employing the stronger reading. This is the more famous U.S. versus Nixon case. This is the case involving, of course, the Watergate tapes in which uh, President Nixon had asserted an executive privilege and an entitlement uh, to decide uh, for himself or for the executive to decide for itself uh, whether it needed to comply with a subpoena seeking those tapes. Um, and the Supreme Court, of course, famously ruled and held that while there is a, an executive privilege, it's qualified and that uh, it w did not apply in that case and that the president was obliged to, to turn those tapes over. Um, I say all this by means of introduction simply to, to uh, frame the debate and to, and to make the point that the debate about the meaning of this one sentence uh, is a debate that has taken uh, place in the form of a tug of war really over uh, you know, the 200 years since Marbury has been decided. And it's a debate that likely uh, will be uh, with us forever. Uh, and as I'm sure you appreciate, uh, it's a debate that's very, very close to the heart of uh, the nation's conversation right now about what the Supreme Court should be doing with the challenge to the Affordable Care Act that is uh, currently under advisement at the court. Um, in particular, uh, and there's of, of course many, many uh, points of entry into thinking about and talking about that case, but one is simply to ask 
For those justices who are clearly troubled by the constitutionality of the individual mandate, um, should, that, um, should that end the inquiry for them? If they believe that the individual mandate is unconstitutional, um, are they obliged under the Constitution to strike it down? Strike it down? Uh, or is there uh, some room for deference, for a thumb to be placed on the scale, uh, for those justices to say, uh, it may be unconstitutional, but it's not clearly so. Um, and there are all sorts of institutional reasons for us uh, to defer to the act of Congress uh, in this particular uh, case. So uh, I think I'll just leave it at, at that right now. Okay, great. And so we're going to move from uh, 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 Article 3 to Article 1. Uh, I think I may have misspoken uh, in setting those articles. So if that's the case, just edit that out of your memories. <laughs> Luckily, there are fewer students here, so they can hold it against me in class. So we're going to move to Honorable uh, Paul Holtz, who's going to give us sort of uh, uh, his impression about uh, on the congressional or legislative branch. Um, it's delightful to be in Hanover in the spring. The uh, speakers are blasting on Fraternity Row, and everything is, everything is good. Um, so let's fast forward from uh, Marbury versus Madison uh, to uh, some point uh, about a month in the future, on June 26th, the term of the Supreme Court ends and it is likely that they will issue a decision um, in the Affordable Care Act case, which uh, General Verrilli, I, I, love, I love calling people by mm -hmm. titles like that, General Verrilli argued, um, uh, an, extraordinary, an extraordinary case, the, the signature legislative accom accomplishment uh, one might say, of at least um, uh, in, recent, in recent memory. Um, and I, I spent years as a lawyer uh, in which I argued before, well, whether it was trial courts or appellate courts, um, about, uh, about the law and what it meant and what, how it ought to be applied and what the intent of legislative bodies was, was a subject that I brought up quite often. Uh, especially when it came to appellate argument and appellate advocacy. Uh, I would go back into the records, um, uh, if it was a, whether it was a state statute or uh, a federal statute. I, I argued often uh, before the First Circuit in Boston when I was a prosecutor, the Attorney General's office, looking for legislative intent. And I'd uh, dig into con um, congressional records in the congressional record, and I'd go back in uh, to uh, committee hearings and see what people had said and what they thought. Uh, because um, when I moved to Congress, it was my job to make law. I, 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 I was charged with, with writing it, with reviewing it, with talking about it in committees, with voting on it uh, on the floor of the U.S. House. Um, my job became to make law. And uh, when I was asked to, to do the panel, I, I, I went looking for some, of, uh, for, for some recent literature about the uh, relationship of uh, Congress uh, to Constitution, to lawmaking, and, and, uh, and because I knew the general was going to be here, uh, I wanted to see what, how that might relate to the Affordable Care Act. I came across a very interesting article, and I'll share some, I want to share some of it with you, because uh, it's an article by Neil Devins um, uh, at uh, Northwestern University School of Law. It's the second of two articles in which he talks about the rise of partisanship and polarization in Congress and the decline in the interest in um, what I might term a responsible approach to thinking about the constitutionality of what it is that Congress does. You would think that in consideration of legislation and particularly in a, as significant a piece of legislation as the Affordable Care Act, um, Congress would pay some real attention to what were clearly going to be constitutional issues. It is not far from anybody's imagination to think that the idea of requiring that people in this country purchase uh, a product or a service, insurance, in this case, lest they uh, pay some sort of penalty or tax, as the question may arise, would be an issue of constitutional moment. Uh, Devin's article is entitled, Why Congress Did Not Think About the Constitution. 
when enacting the Affordable Care Act. Um, and it's interesting, last evening, last night I was with now Minority Leader uh, 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 Nancy Pelosi, who I always think of as Madam Speaker. Um, but the Minority Leader talked about uh, uh, what she observed from her vantage point as a partisan Democrat um, uh, as the paradox that uh, prior to 2006, when Democrats took a majority in the House, in 1994, there was a huge spike in constitutional hearings, hearings about constitutionality, that coincided with uh, the Republicans achieving uh, a majority in the House of Representatives. That gradually withered away with occasional forays into complaining about judicial activism. And we then turn to recent history, uh, a court dominated by people who are called conservative, who um, I would postulate have been the most activist court um, of any in American history. One only has to look uh, at Citizens United to think about judicial activism taken to an entirely new level, and who knows what they're going to do in the Affordable Care Act. Well, to enable that judicial activism, what Devins points out is that um, the 111th Congress, of which I was a member, held 44 hearings about the Affordable Care Act between January of 2009, uh, when we were sworn in, and the March 2010 enactment of the Affordable Care Act. Um, he says, however, lawmakers did not hold any hearings to examine the bill's constitutionality. None. None. There was a question posed on one of my committees by Dennis Kucinich. I served on uh, financial services and oversight and government reform. He asked one question at one hearing um, about, uh, that might have constitutional implications. There was a similar record in the Senate. What's a poor solicitor general to do <laughs> when arguing before the Supreme Court to try to determine congressional intent? What you have in the congressional record is you had the minority taking to the floor of the House to put in the congressional records their concern about constitutionality, but nothing really um, of substance that dealt with the constitutionality. And that is because um, Congress has really changed. Uh, we, people, the citizens of the, of the country are concerned about polarization and politicization. Um, my observation is that uh, the work has moved from legislative to political. Uh, with the rise of partisanship, and we won't go into all that, the um, focus of members of Congress and the leadership especially is how to use hearings not necessarily to advance legislation, but how to use hearings to send political messages. Um, and what that has meant is that uh, certainly with respect to as important an act as the Affordable Care Act, a real dearth of uh, the kind of thinking uh, that, con that Congress could do to give guideposts to those who will have to interpret the law or argue about the law later uh, in terms of saying what it's based on, why it is, and what Congress's thinking was about the powers of taxation and how it related uh, to what would happen with the mandate, the Commerce Clause, and how explicit Congress could have been but was not about the connection between the individual mandate and its implications for health care nationally as it related to the Commerce Clauses, and on and on. You've got a Congress whose job it is to make law, who should, in my judgment, be setting the guideposts on which the judiciary and those who work with the judiciary can look. And with this law in particular, it seems that Congress's role was abdicated, and that's partly because the partisan fight over this law was so terrible, it was all that Nancy Pelosi could do to corral the Democrats to get it passed. Uh, the minority didn't have too much to say about it, and that's what's happening in Congress in the modern day. Okay, thank you very much, Congressman Hodes, and we're going to... Uh, allow a Solicitor General Varelli now to speak for the executive branch. Okay, so a, a couple things to start. Uh, first, I am uh, uh, not speaking in an official capacity today. I'm just here in my personal capacity. Uh, 
and therefore I think we should drop the general stuff. <laughs> and, uh, Don would be fine, and that would help reinforce for everybody that I'm not speaking in my official capacity here. Um, second thing is, solicitors general in their official or personal capacity never, ever, ever talk about pending cases. Um, and so uh, I'm not going to talk about any, pen any pending cases, uh, including the pending case that the prior two presentations veered right at. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm sorry to disappoint you about that, but that's, uh, that's the way in which this office is conducted, and that's uh, the way I'm going to approach it. Um, in the Article 2 of the Constitution, um, the, uh, the, the framers vested the executive authority in the president. And they also uh, gave the president the responsibility to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And all of us in civics class learned that the framers consciously designed this system of separation of powers in order to create friction between the branches, in order to ensure that whatever uh, uh, judgments that the federal government ultimately made and, and when federal power was ultimately exercised, it would ha have been only after a difficult process had been gone through to decide what the, what the position of the federal government would be. Um, and I guess I appreciated that as a theoretical matter when I was a student. But having been in the executive branch now for the last three and a half years, I really get it. Um, <laughs> I get the whole friction thing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and in particular, it's interesting, a significant part of the friction, uh, you know, even, even uh, given everything that was just said, a significant part of the friction, in particular between the Congress and the executive, is actually not always partisan. Um, there's an institutional <coughs> friction there, and that you actually see that the framers' design it does work itself out in pretty much the way that they thought it would 200 plus years ago, in that the Congress <coughs> wants more authority over things that the President thinks the Constitution has given the President authority over. Um, and that's sort of generally the way it works on lots of issues, and that can be true, and it was true, um, I found. Uh, this is more in my White House job than the, my current job, um, but it was certainly true uh, when, the, um, when the Democrats controlled the Congress uh, during the first two years of this administration. More true uh, after <laughs> the Democrats lost the House of Representatives, but still significant degree of, of uh, friction, and it arose in such issues as the question of whether Guantanamo would be closed, the question of whether um, the, uh, the uh, persons detained on Guantanamo would be tried uh, in the United States in federal courts or instead on Guantanamo in military commissions. Um, as you know, there's a lot of friction uh, between the branches there. Um, and it does uh, play into this issue that I uh, talked about in my lecture yesterday, and so some of you were there, and I uh, apologize if I'm recycling a little bit here, but the, it does play out in the role that the Solicitor General has and in the role that the Justice Department has, because there are times when the Justice Department, the Solicitor General, will actually do something that might seem quite contrary to your notion of, of separation of powers, and that the, the executive branch will actually go into the Supreme Court and challenge laws that Congress has enacted rather than defend them. And uh, they challenge laws that Congress has enacted when the executive branch believes that Congress is trying to take authority that belongs to the president. Um, and these issues are very difficult to resolve because they very seldom can be resolved on the basis of a clear command in the text of the Constitution. Um, what we're often talking about, what we're typically talking about, are fundamental postulates that we understand because of the structure of the Constitution that we have three separate branches, that they each have a different role to play, and that figuring out exactly where the border is between them is a challenging thing. Um, we had uh, this case that I argued in, uh, in November of this year that the Supreme Court decided uh, uh, just a few weeks ago about uh, a statute that Congress enacted in 2002, which uh, said that if you were an American citizen born in Jerusalem, you could have Israel listed as your country of birth on your passport. Um, President George Bush, although he signed it into law, um, refused to enforce that provision. 
and President Obama refused to enforce that provision on the ground that the, each of the presidents believed that to be an impermissible intrusion by the Congress on a power that Article II of the Constitution gives exclusively to the president, which is the, as part of the foreign affairs power, the power to decide what countries the United States will recognize as legitimate and what borders of foreign countries the United States will recognize as legitimate. And so um, the United States uh, uh, executive branch has refused to put Israel as the country of birth on passports when people ask for it. And the, and the reason, by the way, is because the United States views Jerusalem at this point um, as a matter that has to be decided by the people who live in the Middle East, and that once the status of Jerusalem is resolved conclusively, then the United States will take a position about it. But since 1948, the United States has said that we're not taking a position on whether Jerusalem is part of Israel or part of another country. Um, and that's been consistent across all presidencies. So the, somebody brought a lawsuit saying, look, there's a statute that says I get to have Israel as is my country of birth on my passport, and the State Department's refusing to do it. So I want an injunction that says, so make the State Department put Israel on my passport. And this case worked its way up to the, the courts, and it raises this separation of powers friction point. It also raised another uh, uh, point that uh, John addressed, which is this idea of political questions. One argument that the government made is, look, this is a fight between two branches of government about a power that we think belongs exclusively to the president, and this is not something that the judiciary should have any role under our Constitution in resolving. That was an argument that actually the Court of Appeals agreed with in that case and, and ruled against the party seeking to have uh, Israel listed on the passport uh, on the ground that the courts just shouldn't get into this at all. It's not part of the judicial power to do it. Case went to the Supreme Court and uh, I argued it in November and two uh, argued both issues, that it was a political question that the judiciary should stay out of and that to the extent it wasn't a political question, this was none of Congress's business <laughs> and that it was the executive branch's decision what countries to recognize and, uh, and, uh, and what borders to recognize. And of course, uh, Congress has a different view about that. Congress's view is that, look, we've always regulated what passports say, and this is just regulating what passports say. And, um, so the Supreme Court decided this case in, in uh, March, and what it ruled was that this case wasn't the kind of political question that the judiciary should stay out of. This was a, a, the classic kind of case in which under Marbury against Madison, the judiciary should say what the law is because Congress passed a statute and it's a question of whether that statute violates the separation of powers. That's what the judiciary's job is to decide those kinds of things. Uh, so the Supreme Court reached that issue, ruled that the courts should decide this, but then didn't reach the fundamental issue of the conflict between the Congress and the executive over who had the power to make these foreign relations decisions. It said that hasn't been ruled on yet, so we're going to send it back <coughs> to the lower courts to rule on that first, and then we'll consider that again later. Um, but it's a pretty good example, actually, of the friction, right? I mean, there you have it all. You have the Congress and the President fighting about who gets to make these judgments about what foreign nations will recognize and what foreign borders will recognize. And you have this question about, is this the sort of thing that under our system of government the court should be involved in at all? And it, it turns out that uh, working through these separation of powers issues is an important part of the job I have now, and actually a very interesting part of the job I have now, and one that is just going to be with us as long as we have our Constitution, because the friction's built in there, and by design, there aren't clear answers to these questions, and they need to be fought out over time. So, so with that, I think... Great. Okay. So um, we will open. Thank you, Mr. Varelli. Yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> good. I should say that each of our panelists here, uh, the congressman uh, is obviously a Dartmouth alum, and the other two, uh, one has uh, uh, his daughter's already in the class, and Professor uh, Gravy's son is going to be a Dartmouth student. So uh, um, this is always good. So questions. And can we start off with a question from a student, right? Don't be shy. No tests. Yeah, <laughs> not going to be graded. This is for Representative Hogan. So when the Republicans took over Congress, uh, they made an effort to put what part of the Constitution uh, they would look for attached to the law. I know you haven't been in Congress since then, but can you comment on, on whether that 
you find that that's just a uh, kind of an empty gesture, whether they're sticking with that and whether that's you know good for the Congress or, or not? Um, I, 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 I didn't find it surprising that when uh, uh, the Republicans retook control after the 2010 sweep, uh, that new efforts at uh, constitutional questions would arise. I, um, I mean, you know, here in, the, in New Hampshire, um, a similar sweep happened, and uh, there was a bill introduced to uh, make sure that any bill introduced would reference the Magna Carta. So I don't know, maybe that was a little bit of one-upsmanship. Um, I, 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 you know, if you look at the Constitution, there is nothing in the Constitution that says Congress shall have the power to regulate health care for the citizenry, citizenry of the country. And in fact, there's much more that's not in the Constitution than is in the Constitution. So I think it is um, uh, an absurd empty gesture and uh, political posturing to require that bills uh, name uh, constitutional provisions. I, I, I just don't think it's, I don't, I don't think it's necessary and I think it's political posturing. Yep, sure. Um, the, there is this uh, some notion that the uh, Solicitor General is the tenth justice. Uh, I don't think the other nine justices do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and in, in, in fact, that, that phrase, while it has a kernel of truth to it, um, which I'll get to in a sec, it, in many ways it's a phrase that uh, obscures more than it illuminates in that the reality is that the Solicitor General is an officer in the executive branch of the government, uh, and the authority that the Solicitor General exercises is authority that the Congress has given to the Attorney General by law, and the Attorney General then by regulation has given it to the Solicitor General to exercise. And so I'm responsible to the Attorney General, and then ultimately to the President in the exercise of authority. But um, having said that, and so I'm firmly in the executive branch, um, the, having said that, uh, the Solicitor General has always been understood as having a different set of obligations maybe than anybody else in the executive branch. But they come from sort of tradition and practical good sense as opposed to the, any separation of powers idea of where authority should be allocated. Like the notion of being the 10th justice, I think comes, it, it's a way of describing the kernel of truth in it is that the, we represent the United States before the Supreme Court. The court hears 80 cases a year. The United States participates in about 60 of those 80 cases. So we are there all the time. And it is therefore, and that means a lot of things. One is that it's especially important that the Supreme Court has complete confidence in the presentations that we make to it, both in paper and in oral argument, that there can be no doubt about the integrity of what we say and the accuracy of what we say. And whereas lawyers in private practice might be able to put the pedal to the metal and argue that a case means a little bit more than it really means as a precedent, we really have to be careful never to do that because our credibility with the court, <coughs> given how much we participate, is absolutely vital. And so a huge part of our job is maintaining our credibility with the court and um, being candid in the co with the court and forthright with the court in a more fulsome way than, than private litigants would be. 
And then in addition, the, we play a pretty significant gatekeeping role because the Solicitor General has to decide what cases the United States will ask the Supreme Court to hear. And so we've got to exercise discretionary judgment. And the, the, so the justices have occasionally described the Solicitor General as a gatekeeper. That you know, if, if I say no petition for certiorari, that case is not going for them. They don't get a chance to decide whether to hear it if I don't take it up. And so um, exercising that authority to decide what, to, what cases go up um, uh, does you know, play a role in their ultimate uh, exercise of their authority. And then there's a notion, too, with respect to the Congress that we have a responsibility to defend federal statutes in court unless they fit into uh, one of two categories, they either unless they infringe on the executive branch's authority unless, or unless there's no reasonable argument to be made in their defense. Uh, so we have a set of responsibilities, and then the Solicitor General is supposed to exercise those responsibilities in a manner that is independent in the sense that the Solicitor General looks out for the long-term interests of the United States. And now it's not independence like a judge. The Solicitor General doesn't have life tenure. You know, the, the Solicitor General can be, serves at the pleasure of the President. But what the Solicitor General does is have the power to persuade <coughs> the Attorney General or the President that something that they may, some position they may want to take is one that the law just doesn't allow them to take. And ultimately, uh, in an extreme case, if the Solicitor General thinks that uh, the Attorney General or the President is doing something that's illegitimate, then the Solicitor General can resign. It's never happened. And, uh, but, the, but that's sort of where the Solicitor General's independence ultimately comes from, is not from any guarantee in the constitutional structure, but from that sort of practical reality. Now, having said that, I should just want to make clear that in my uh, tenure, nothing remotely like that has come up. But, uh, uh, but, I, but I think that's kind of the 10th the justice idea is a way of finding a, a bumper sticker to describe that whole complex of things. But as a bumper sticker, it's really, it's, it, as I said, it can be obscure more than it illuminates. So. I'm going to have people use this just because then it uh, records. Yeah, I have a question, and I'm picking up on what the students said before. Um, of course, if the case does come to the court, then Congress and the executive branch, I suppose, together, if it's not a case of Congress overriding a presidential veto, does give the constitutional justification for a case. And I'm thinking of particularly of, of, of an act, the Violence Against Women Act, which, of course, was overthrown and overruled in the um, U.S. versus Morrison. And I would like to get your thoughts on the limits of the Commerce Clause, because uh, that case, of course, showed some of the limits. And also, just your feeling of whether or not the administration sometimes enacts with Congress and a, a law that they have some questions as to the ultimate constitutionality of it, but they enact it anyway for political reasons. So I'm assuming that you're asking Paul or John that question, because <laughs> there's no possible way I'm going to answer it. <laughs> so. I would ask him if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I would say that uh, political concerns are never far away from the, think, the thought process of what happens between the executive branch and congressional leaders when considering major, uh, major legislation. Um, generally, the attempt I, uh, certainly ought to be to consider the questions of constitutionality in the context of, uh, of, of the law. Um, when I authored, uh, when, when I authored um, bills, um, and I, by the way, when members of Congress uh, author bills, they don't take up the pen or sit there with computers, generally. Some may, um, and I certainly had a hand, but often uh, bills are referred out to um, an office of legal counsel and others who help in uh, the drafting, uh, the drafting of the bills. I don't. I think it's rare that legislation it would be is put forward for purely political purposes. But clearly, the political implications of legislation are considered during the introduction, the drafting, and the and the introduction of it. Congressman Hodes, you talked about the fact that uh, 
the, well, rather the lack of discussion of the constitutionality when it came to the health care bill. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the strategy, what strategy they may, there may be about making statements or um, creating some kind of uh, the, the congressional record for a bill before it's passed, and to what extent, in general, there's thought about creating the legal footprint or if it's more of a political footprint when it comes to floor speeches and this kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, my observation is that certainly while, while I was there, um, politics were such an overriding concern for both leadership and members that um, uh, the work on committees was generally, by the time members of Congress uh, were sitting in committee asking people questions, it was kabuki theater. Uh, that was highly scripted. Uh, the staff had uh, done much, uh, if not most, of the work. They often provided scripts to members to uh, elicit answers from from witnesses that were, um, you know, pre you know pre predetermined. Um, members of Congress used, uh, and this is this is not new, used committee hearings uh, as forum to fora to make speeches. Um, with with the hint or glint of a question, uh, a, a question attached, and generally uh, the purposes um, uh, were political because we've in 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 the current atmosphere where the uh, leadership, the political leadership of the parties, is focused on um, uh, re-election campaigns, raising money. Um, serving constituents, having talking points, and scoring talking points, as opposed to, um, uh, let's say, a, a higher uh, level of statesmanship at which the good of the country um, and legislation that would effectively serve the good of the country is, um, it, it might be seen as the ultimate object. I think things have gotten to a place where politics rule more than the kind of thoughtful legislating that breeds compromise and gives a safe place to ask questions and examine the constitutionality um, of bills. Now, what's happened is the, the questions of constitutionality have been left largely in both houses to the Judiciary Committees. It used to be more widespread in the past. Now, uh, let's say 70 percent of hearings that are held uh, that have to do with constitutionality are held in the Judiciary Committees, and they're not immune from the kind of political polarization that uh, Devins talks about in his article that, and that, we've, that we have all uh, observed. Um, thank you for this great session. Uh, I came here when uh, Jimmy Carter was president. I do have Israel in my passport. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing that, that I admire and, and have thought a great deal about is, is a, what the founding fathers went through to put this whole wonderful experiment together. And at this day and age, the, the one thing that, that I often think about is the adaptability of either three branches given the powerful media influence, the powerful corporate influence, do you gentlemen honestly believe that what we have today is capable of adapting to all these influences? Uh, it, you know, I, I just wonder about that. I, I see the Supreme Court acting pretty much in a conservative, consistent way. I see the the Congress carrying on, the executive branch uh, doing their thing, politics or, or, or otherwise. But from an adaptability point of view and with the way things are globally shifting and changing dramatically, are we in good shape? <laughs> uh, well, to the first question, um, the Constitution has, uh, has, has adapted itself to change uh, to just an absolutely remarkable degree, right, over, over what, 230 years now. Um, 
And I don't see any reason why um, that could not continue. Um, that's not to say that there's uh, you know, no reason for a revisitation of aspects of it or, or amendments uh, to the document. Um, there will never be a consensus about the extent to which the Constitution should be a flexible document. Um, uh, you know, there's, the many believe that it should be read uh, as sort of a super statute um, and that its uh, original meaning, quote unquote, uh, ought to be ascertained and that ought to be the beginning and end of constitutional interpretation. Uh, many others disagree with that and there, I imagine that'll always be the case. Um, the fact is that um, it's, it's survived through um, tremendously troubled times um, through a, you know a secession and a civil war um, it's uh, it's survived through um, you know horrific uh, group torts uh, such as slavery and, and other uh, you know in the apartheid that, that, that followed slavery um, just me speaking I, I don't see why it, it, it cannot um, <laughs> but we'll see <laughs> Congressman Hogue or Ms. Riley, did you want to take that on? Or? So the, the, all I would add to that, very, very eloquent statement, um, is that the, if you read Hamilton or you read Madison, I think they <coughs> understood that what they were trying to do was to give the national government enough authority and enough flexibility that it could adapt itself to the crises that they understood that they could never even foresee uh, because they wanted this constitution to endure for the ages. And so I think so long as we approach uh, 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 the fundamental questions with that spirit in mind, then I'm optimistic. So this is a hypothetical, so I'm hoping Mr. Varelli can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very good at dodging those. <laughs> Suppose Congress had done, um, had the time to do and went through a normal process in passing the ACA, and suppose uh, Congress had done just what Mr. Hodes had anticipated and really spelled out, yes, we're using our commerce power in passing the ACA here, and we think it's squarely within the Constitution. What should or what could the judiciary do with that statement on, um, from Congress? Mm. <laughs> that, um, so, the, uh, just as a factual matter, actually there are findings at the beginning of the Affordable Care Act that say it's an exercise of the commerce power. So those are the, uh, those exist now. Um, what did they the, say right before the mandate? Also. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that because of the quote from Marbury against Madison, it's, you know, it's ultimately up to the court to decide what the law is and what the Constitution means. And it's been the law for a very long time that Congress doesn't have to identify the source of its constitutional authority. And without talking about any specific case, um, it seems like that has to be the the right understanding of the Constitution because otherwise the judiciary is going to be, uh, I mean, what sense does it make to say that a law that would be perfectly within the power of Congress to enact uh, is, not, is invalid because, and the judiciary can strike it down because Congress didn't say that, it, it didn't identify the specific source of power that made it valid. If it's valid, it's valid. And so, the, the court has always, I think, understood that um, it's, like, findings can be helpful. And the court has said findings can be helpful to illuminate what Congress thought it was doing. But the absence of findings can't be a reason to uh, declare that something is unconstitutional. And, and I think it ha has to be that way. Otherwise, um, you're superintending the process of making laws in a way that there isn't any constitutional justification. And in fact, for, for 70 years, it's fair to say that the court has shown great deference to the acts of Congress, um, great deference. So, you know, in that context, because I, I don't have to tread as lightly as uh, Don does. Oh, I wasn't um, treading lightly. No, no, no. 
I mean, on, in terms of actual cases, <laughs> if were the court uh, in this case, you know, in, in this case to strike uh, the mandate, it would uh, be you know, a fairly monumental um, uh, break, at least with, with precedent in the way the court has approached um, acts of Congress. While, while the uh, separation of powers is obviously with three branches that you've represented very nicely, uh, we have another separation of powers, which is between the states and the federal government, which is sometimes, I think, a very relevant issue. And a f kind of fifth branch of government, in a way, is academia, particularly law schools, for example, but, but where there are f another group of people who, who are sometimes thinking of ideas that get in the environment and get into decisions. And I want to give an example of each of them. First of all, the states. There's a lot of discussion about, in the Health Care Act, about the mandate for, by insurance. Every one of the 50 states has a mandate to buy automobile insurance. Those mandates, to my knowledge, have never been overturned by law. And the question is, does a settled practice at the state level have any influence on the principle of a law establishing a mandate to buy insurance for everybody who has a particular you know, residence in the state. Secondly, uh, just uh, another point, uh, for instance, uh, Congressman Hodes uh, wasn't clear about uh, constitutionality. Uh, it's been said this is a tax. Article 8, Section 1 says Congress can, can enact excises, tax, imposts, there's a funny thing, they have four different words for the way of getting money. They don't say mandate, but just about anything else. Uh, for the general welfare. Health is part of general welfare because there are such things as diseases that can spread across state lines because actually they're, uh, oh my. Yes, there's, I found it interesting that all the discussions of health had to do with things like broken arms and not contagious diseases. Very curious. I only say that because as somebody in academia who works in, 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 in things like consulting at the government level, I find that I am sometimes asked in the consulting work I do for special advice that will have a real effect, in this case in the Department of Defense, but it's in the executive. Uh, and I think that we forget that academics also have a huge responsibility in inputting ideas about what the three branches will do. And the states do as well. I wonder what your reactions are to those points. Um, well, I'll, let me just comment that I think um, certainly one of the central questions throughout our history is and will remain the relationship between the power of the federal government and that of the states, and it plays out uh, both in uh, the political context, obviously, repeatedly, um, and certainly it w is on the minds and, in my judgment, at the core of many of the arguments around uh, the validity of the act that we've been uh, that we've been talking about. It's just it's a central theme um, in our fragile experiment in democracy uh, that the Federalist Papers. Uh, are, are, are all over, and we continue to be. Um, a lively subject, it's why we have such an adaptable um, system, because the question in my, it was never going to be resolved. Um, if you could make one constitutional tweak to improve the interplay among the three branches, what would it be? I mean, I'm just sort of thinking to myself, why not have a president run for six years and that be it instead of these long election processes? But I'd just be curious to see what you would do to tweak the Constitution to make our government and country work better. Uh, that's not one I can answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't really, I don't have one either, really, off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, um, I would amend the Constitution to make sure that the Citizens United decision uh, was done away with and could never come back. I think it's uh, poisonous to our democracy in a very fundamental way, and I think it needs to be uh, 
uh, overturned and uh, if it needs to be done with a constitutional amendment of, of some sort, I proposed one. I suggest that it's the right thing to do um, because uh, right now I, uh, I'm afraid our democracy is for sale. One last question. Mr. Varelli, you talked about the, the friction between the branches, the, even the institutional friction between them. And in your experience, does the tension between those branches ever surpass the point of ambition, counteracting ambition in the Madisonian conception, to the point of like, inefficiency or unproductivity? And if so, do you have an example of that? <laughs> so um, I think Madison's point was that ambition, counteracting ambition, was supposed to make the government somewhat inefficient. <laughs> um, I think that was the idea behind it, um, that decisions wouldn't get made uh, and implemented too quickly and without uh, a, a sustained enough sense that, that this was an important enough thing to do. Um, having said that, but and, and without offering any specific examples, which I don't think I should do, yeah, you know, um, there is a there is a difference between friction and gridlock, and um, and I, I I think it's certainly reasonable to reach the conclusion that um, we are uh, sometimes at least closer to the latter than to the former. So. Great. Well, why don't we leave it at that and thank our panelists.